Let's go over some of the key points from our lecture uh, on monotremes and marsupials. Um, the, let's see if I can get this darn thing to work. There we go. Uh, the first thing to remember is that uh, regardless of whether we're talking about monotremes, marsupials, or or eutherian mammals, that they are all synapsids, um, and they're derived from the synapsid reptiles, uh, from the therapsids, um, and before that, the pelicosaurs. Uh, so we went on at some length about uh, the advantages of the synapsid design. Uh, remember that all modern reptiles uh, are either anapsids or diapsids. Uh, the, ana the anapsid design is found in turtles, and then the diapsid design is found in uh, all other reptiles, uh, and the dinosaurs, and the birds. Uh, so uh, the key there is that the synapsid design makes it possible for the temporalis muscle to attach uh, to the top of the skull, um, and bulge out and be significantly larger, giving the animal uh, a much greater bite force. Uh, recall, too, that um, the pelicosaurs and the uh, uh, therapsid reptiles um, showed up um, in the Pennsylvanian, so in the Carboniferous, and they uh, had a small adaptive radiation in the Permian. Um, but at the end of the Permian, there's this huge mass extinction event. Um, so um, only some of those animals make it through, the synapsids make it through, uh, and that's where we see the uh, origin of the mammals. So the mammals show up right at the beginning of the Triassic, uh, which is obviously when the um, when you have this huge adaptive radiation for the reptiles too, that ultimately includes the dinosaurs and then much later the birds. Uh, so the important point to remember there is that the end Permian mass extinction was huge. 95% uh, of all species on the planet went extinct. Uh, that was a much more significant mass extinction event than, than the one that occurred at the end of the Cretaceous. Um, so just as a reminder, the therapsids, uh, or the pelicosaurs in this case, uh, were um, heavily invested, we think, in thermoregulation. Uh, they did have a synapsid skull design. Uh, so it makes sense that they would be the precursors to um, the mammals. Remember, too, the, the key about being a mammal um, uh, is that the lower jaw is comprised of only one bone, and that is the dentary. Uh, regardless of whether you're a mammal or a reptile, the only bone that supports teeth uh, in the lower jaw, at any rate, is going to be the dentary bone. Um, so all the other bones get shifted around, reduced in size, or moved, um, the only bone that stays behind in mammals is the dentary bone. Uh, that means then that all mammals have a dentary squamosal jaw articulation, while reptiles uh, have a, a quadrate and articular um, articulation. The quadrate and the articular migrate up into the ear uh, and become the incus and the stapes. So there too, uh, birds and reptiles have but one inner ear bone, namely the columella. Uh, in mammals, you have three. There are no um, vertebrates with uh, two inner ear bones. Why? Because two inner ear bones doesn't work, and we can talk about the uh, mechanics of that at some point. Um, another important point is that in mammals, the cochlea is coiled like a snail shell, and you see that on the right of the image here. Um, interestingly enough, in monotremes, it is not coiled. So one of the features that um, that illustrates the close affinity between monotremes and uh, reptiles is the fact that the cochlea is not coiled. Uh, now, uh, currently, the distribution of the world's uh, monotremes and marsupials is primarily in um, Australia, uh, New Zealand, and New Guinea. So um, the lower part of um, the globe uh, but their origin, uh, it isn't at all clear that their origin is in that region. Uh, there are lots of marsupials uh, in South America, and we have one marsupial left in North America. We at one time had more marsupials, um, but as a consequence of the great faunal interchange that took place with the formation of the Panamanian land bridge, uh, most of those were um, lost because of that faunal interchange. Uh, some of the oldest fossils that we have are from North America, uh, so it's not uh, clear that 
uh, marsupials and monotremes had an origin in Australia. Now, obviously, if you talk to Australian mammalogists, they're pretty adamant that they did originate there, but then you can imagine that there's some, um, I don't want to call it patriotism, but some kind of regionalism going on there. So uh, it, I suppose it is to be expected. Um, but obviously what happened, uh, the, end or the end Permian mass extinction is essentially caused by the formation of Pangaea. Uh, that's when the um, uh, synapsids show up. That's when the first mammals show up. Uh, so it's the formation of Pangaea which causes that um, mass extinction event. Notice that all the continents are connected. As the continents begin to break up, right, um, mammals tend to become isolated. So we know that the mammals evolved when all the continents were together. As the, as the continents split up, the marsupials, for the most part, became trapped in the lower half. Um, and then, of course, they got trapped in Antarctica and Australia as those continents split off. It was after those continents split off that the eutherian mammals evolved. So the eutherians evolved after uh, all the marsupials had already, uh, and monotremes, made their appearance in uh, Antarctica and Australia, and New Zealand, and New Guinea, and Tasmania, and so on. Um, so uh, that's an important point to keep in mind. Uh, there are obviously eutherian mammals present in Australia, uh, bats got there by flying, uh, rodents got there by sweepstakes rafting, and of course we introduced all the lagomorphs, all the, all the cats, all the dogs, and all of that sort of stuff. Uh, dogs were introduced probably by the aborigines. Uh, the dingoes are um, there in Australia, right? And they obviously didn't evolve there. Uh, they were clearly introduced by the aborigines. All right, so a couple of key points um, to think about. Uh, and the first one, as you see on the left, and we've made this point a couple of times, is the posture that you see in mammals um, and reptiles. Uh, reptiles have a sprawling gait. Mammals have an upright gait. Uh, and that, of course, has energetic consequences and locomotory consequences. Uh, interestingly enough, the monotremes have a reptilian gait uh, or a reptilian posture. Um, and you can look at the two links that we have, the one for... Um, the echidnas and the other for the duckbill platypus, and you'll see that that uh, is pretty accurate. Uh, the other thing to remember is Bergman's rule, and that is namely as um, temperatures decline, then uh, mean body mass goes up. So that as you move towards the equator, animals tend to be smaller, and as you move towards the uh, poles, animals tend to be larger. That applies not just to eutherians, but to um, uh, metatherians and prototherians as well. So monotremes and marsupials follow that same rule. Uh, another important point, uh, and we talked about this in the first lecture, is that all mammals provide some kind of milk for their offspring. Um, that milk is uh, species specific. Um, and we went over this table a little bit in class, pointing out that there are some species which have really high fat content and high protein content. And those tend to be species with uh, very high energy demands. Um, so just, just to point out that that is species specific. Interestingly, uh, when you look at marsupials, um, especially in kangaroos that have delayed implantation uh, and can have uh, two different ages of joeys attached to different nipples, um, the milk produced by each nipple is going to be different. So there is a balance there, and the composition of the milk changes with the, um, with the caloric needs or the energetic needs, nu nutritional needs of the offspring as they're developing. Uh, we also talked about regionalization of the vertebral column. We went over this mostly in the very first lecture, um, and this illustration just points that out. Uh, reptiles have ribs everywhere. Uh, mammals restrict uh, the ribs just to the thoracic region. Mammals divide the trunk vertebra into thoracic and lumbar. Uh, mammals have more sacral vertebra. Um, that's because they're generating more power. Um, and mammals have more cervical vertebra, so they have greater head mobility, uh, which is important if you're a more active hunter or you're uh, more active at trying to avoid predation. Um, and notice also they have this upright posture. We've been over that a number of times.
All right. Um, and uh, one of the consequences of that particular uh, regionalization of the vertebral column and the increased number of, of um, sacral vertebrae and the, the upright posture is the running speeds that they're capable of achieving. So cheetahs are easily capable of 110 kilometers per hour. Uh, pronghorn antelope aren't far behind. Uh, and then three-toed sloths are at the bottom at simply one kilometer per hour. But then three-toed sloths don't spend much time on the ground. Uh, most of their spent time is spent hanging. Uh, we'll talk about some quirks of three-toed sloths when we um, get to the Xenarthrans. Okay, uh, we did talk a little bit about locomotion in, um, in kangaroos uh, and the fact that they are one of the few groups of animals where the energetic cost of locomotion actually decreases the faster they go. Um, and that is a consequence of the, um, the um, tendons and ligaments that they have in their back leg that are essentially acting like springs. Uh, so when they jump, uh, they're taking advantage of the recoil on the spring. Every time they land, they're cocking that spring and using gravity to cock that spring again. When they take off, they recapture that energy. Uh, so the more times they do that, the more energy they, they recapture and the lower the cost. Um, so that's sort of a, an interesting quirk. All right. Uh, talking about monotremes, we made a big deal about the fact that monotremes are very reptile-like um, in their... Um, urogenital openings. Uh, just as in reptiles, there is a single opening uh, to the outside, and that opening is the cloaca. Uh, everything happens through the cloaca, and the same is true in monotremes. On the left, you have an example of a monotreme. Uh, there is the cloacal opening, so the urinogen, there is the, the urinary, the urethra empties out into um, that opening, uh, the colon empties into that opening and the reproductive tract empties into that opening. So everything goes through that particular opening. Notice too that on monotremes, the ovaries are very large. Um, they produce relatively large eggs. Monotremes, so the echidnas and the duckbell platypuses produce these large uh, leathery-like eggs. So they're not cleidoic eggs. They're not the hard-shelled eggs, um, but they are these large, um, these large leathery kind of eggs. Uh, they do have a placenta. So when we talk about placental mammals, namely us and rats and mice and all of that sort of stuff, um, we talk about us as having placentas. Uh, that is true. Our placentas are a little bit different. We have more invaginations on the placenta, so there's more exchange of, um, of, uh, of uh, nutrients and whatnot and blood across the placental wall. Um, there's less of that that takes place in most monotremes and marsupials. Uh, as an aside, there is one group of marsupials, namely the numbats, um, that have a placenta that looks just exactly like the placentas that you see in, in eutherian, so in us. Uh, when you look at marsupials, uh, notice this sort of odd structure. Uh, now you have uh, a vaginal opening, but the va vagina is bipartite, so it splits uh, into two. Um, so there really, there's a lateral, there's a left and a right uh, vaginal canal, um, and then uh, you have two uteri. Um, and those two uteri you see in, in lots of other mammals too. So dogs, cats, rats, mice, they all have two uteri. Uh, primates tend to have just one, but then we have two fallopian tubes as, as any mammal would. Um, so that change in the structure of the um, reproductive uh, tract is uh, sort of interesting. Uh, the sperm are different in, in monotremes uh, and in marsupials as well. Uh, they're not like eutherian sperm. Um, and importantly, the um, back to the uh, skeletal system, uh, the pectoral girdle is fundamentally different. So the pectoral girdle in, mars in monotremes uh, is very reptile-like. So uh, reptiles, what you see on the left there, they have um, an inner clavicle and coracoids and sternums and um, precoracoids and scapula and suprascapulas and clavicles and all of that sort of stuff. By the time you get to us, the eutherian mammals, you simply have the scapula um, and the sternum, obviously. Um, and in some forms, you have a clavicle. In some forms, you don't. In the monotremes, the illustration in the center, uh, 
um, what you see is this very reptilian kind of a girdle. Uh, so that girdle is designed to support this animal in that uh, sprawling posture. Um, it's great, keeps the animal up. Obviously, it's big, bulky, heavy. It's expensive to produce. It limits the kind of locomotion that you're capable of. Uh, so it, it obviously uh, is improved upon in uh, marsupials and, and uh, eutherian mammals. Uh, but that's why the echidnas and platypuses have this sprawling kind of a gait. Uh, another interesting point about, um, about uh, monotremes is that they are venomous, um, particularly in the duck-billed platypuses. They have a, a spur uh, associated with the back leg. That spur shows up in both sexes. Um, but is in the, the female offspring, it, um, it never really develops. Uh, it's, only, um, it's only fully functional and, and mature in the males, and it's used in male-male combat. Um, an important thing that we talked about at some length in lecture was uh, the fact that um, marsupials uh, have very short um, very short interuterine periods. Uh, here you look at uh, the total um, development time for offspring in marsupials compared to placental mammals. Uh, so in placental mammals, the amount of time that the um, embryo spends inside the uterus is quite extensive. And then after birth, uh, there's, a, there's a period of lactation where the female is, continues to nurture the young. In marsupials, the amount of time spent in the uterus is very short. Uh, most of the time is spent in the pouch uh, being nursed um, at the nipple. Uh, so there's this fundamental shift. And of course, one thing that the marsupials did not do is solve all the immunological problems that are associated with keeping this foreign object inside, um, inside the body. Uh, that's, reflected, um, uh, that's reflected in... Uh, this graph right here. So when you look at the the weight of the mother, okay, and this is a log scale. So if we look at marsupials uh, ranging in size from about uh, 20 grams or 15 grams all the way up to uh, 90 kilos or something like that, um, notice what happens to the size of their of their offspring. And these are weights in milligrams, not grams. Uh, so even uh, a giant red kangaroo, which which is up there around you know 80, 90 kilograms, uh, is going to have an offspring which only weighs 800 milligrams. Okay, so the offspring of this great big animal are tiny. They're just the size of a little bean. Um, so most of the development of that little bean is going to take place in the pouch. Uh, we talked about what the advantages of that might be. Uh, one was that the female had the ability then to um, remove the offspring from the nipple, from the teat, and then, you know, get rid of it and then try with, the with another pregnancy. Remember, they have delayed implantation. Uh, sort of times get tough and they don't think that they can make it. They can get rid of the offspring, stop spending energy on that, and they already have a new one um, ready to go. Uh, that works reasonably well, I suppose. If they lived in Texas, they'd get arrested or something or sued, but there it is. Um, let's go back um, and look at this uh, table. Here's some uh, general skeletal and anatomical differences between metatheres um, and eutheres. Uh, we talked about this. The One of the important points that we made was uh, the presence of the um, epipubic bones. Um, that was one big one. The epipubic bones are involved in ventilation of the lungs. Uh, the other important point uh, that we talked about was the fact that the scrotum is anterior to the penis in, in, uh, in marsupials. And it's obviously, um, I'm, I'm sorry, it's anterior to the penis um, in marsupials and it's posterior in, um, in placental mammals. Uh, we talked about that and we talked about how it is that kangaroos manage to uh, copulate. Um, remember the story about the St. Louis Zoo. Okay, um, another important uh, feature for marsupials uh, is what's going on with the hands. Um, there are all of these different sort of hand morphologies. Uh, and that seems to be one of these driving uh, driving features in 
um, uh, in marsupials. So, for example, if you look at that center row, there's a nice example of something that's called syndactyly. Uh, so you have fusion of some digits. Uh, you also get opposable digits and things of that sort. So uh, there's a lot going on with the hands and feet, and I think that illustrates uh, the diversity of locomotor modes um, that these guys are going through, and and also the the utility that they have for the um, using their appendages uh, when they're foraging. All right, um, you can get all of this out of your book. We just talked about a very basic some of the major groups of uh, marsupials. Uh, the only real thing that I want to point out, there are a couple of things that I want to point out here. Uh, one is that uh, you notice there are these uh, marsupials which show up in South, uh, North and South America. Uh, only the didelphids show up in North America, but in South America you have the microbiotherids, the didelphids, and then the canalestids. So uh, the fauna of marsupials in South America is, is pretty rich. There's, there are quite a few species there. When you look at marsupials, you can see uh, sort of all of these ecological um, ecological, uh, I don't want to say they're, um, they're correlates, right? That they fill the same sort of ecological niches that, that eutherians do. Uh, so uh, didelphus, I'm not exactly sure what didelphids uh, would match uh, anywhere. They are sort of their own unique animal. Um, one interesting thing uh, before we move on is uh, we can also divide marsupials up into two groups. Um, there are the polyprotodontidae and then the diprotodontids. So the, diprot the diprotodontia have two front teeth and the polyprotodontia have many front teeth. Uh, and one easy way to, when you pick up a, a skull, you know, out in the woods or something, you count the number of incisors, you right away know that it's a marsupial simply because of the number of uh, upper incisors that they have. Uh, so here's the canalestid, which is a, a rat opossum, also a South American. And here's a microbiotherid, um, Dromisiops. So those are all South American sorts of uh, marsupials. If we look at the marsupial fauna uh, in Australia, New, Zini, New Zealand, New Guinea, um, uh, Tasmania, uh, then you get things like the thylacine, which is the marsupial uh, wolf. Sometimes it's referred to as a marsupial cat, um, but it obviously is very canid-like. Uh, they went extinct back in the 1930s. Uh, here's a, a myrmecobeid. Uh, these are the numbats. Um, numbats have a very um, placental-like placenta. So the, the placenta that they have is very much like yours. It's not like the typical... Um, marsupial. Uh, then you have things like quals, which are the marsupial carnivores, marsupial cats, that sort of thing. Um, they're very cool. Quals are, are just awesome animals. Uh, Robert Rose at Old Dominion University uh, spent much of his res research career working on quals um, uh, down in Tasmania. Um, and that's, he, he has lots of interesting stories about these animals. Um, paramelids, the bandicoots, um, uh, the bilbies. Uh, bilbies are kind of like uh, the Australian version of a, ja of a jackrabbit or a gigantic kangaroo rat, something like that. Um, but the diversity of these animals is extreme. Um, and then, of course, uh, we talked a little bit about uh, the fascolarctids. These are the koala bears and the fact that they um, are arboreal folivores. They are eating only eucalyptus leaves. Um, and because of the high alkaloid content of eucalyptus leaves, these guys are um, basically stoned all the time. Uh, they have very long gut retention times. Gut retention time is somewhere between 14 and 21 days. Uh, so roughly every three weeks, they're going to come out of a tree and then um, defecate on the ground somewhere. Uh, wombats, uh, the Vombatidae, these are um, sort of a cross between a beaver and a, and a marmot. Um, they're absolutely glorious animals. The skulls are really robust. They're really uh, interesting, interesting animals. And then we uh, talked at length about macropodids. Uh, I am going to make available to you a very cool video um, called Faces in the Mob. It's about um, 
some eastern gray kangaroos uh, and I guess a year in the in the life of this one particular mob of kangaroos uh, it's well worth uh, the time watching it. I will um, put a link to it on my webpage. Uh, you should definitely take the time if you if you want to understand um, uh, the evolutionary or socio sociobiology of um, of marsupials that or for that matter any group of mammals uh, that would be an excellent video to watch. Uh, and then, of course, probably my favorite uh, marsupial of all is the uh, feather-tailed glider. This little tiny. 12-gram uh, glider. Um, it's called that because it has a tail that's shaped like a feather. Um, they are just absolutely amazing animals. They live in Australia and they also show up... Um, now I guess Australia is it. I don't think they are in New Zealand or in, or in uh, New Guinea. Uh, within, the same, um, within the same family there is another uh, genus that does not glide. Um, and that's kind of an interesting animal as well. That animal shows up in New Guinea. All right, uh, there are all sorts of other um, sort of ecological correlates. There are marsupial moles and, and all of that. So basically any ecological niche that you have uh, filled by a placental mammal somewhere is also filled by a marsupial with, with two exceptions. Um, and those are the two things that I wanna, want you to think about. Uh, the first is there are no marsupial whales, right? Uh, so with the exception of uh, the platypus, uh, marsupials really, I know platypuses are, are monotremes, um, but they don't, they don't get to the point where they're able to invade the aquatic um, habitat. Uh, the other thing that marsupials never did was uh, form something like a marsupial bat. Um, so there's a perfect exam question. Why are there no marsupial uh, whales? Uh, why are there no marsupial bats? Um, all right, that's it for this recap. Uh, see you guys on Tuesday.